and welcome to the show. I'm Rod Rodriguez. This is Connecting Vets, very own The Back Brief, where we talk about the news of the week that you might have missed. Um, and to help me along with this particular story, I have the wonderful Libby Howe. Libby, thanks for being on the show. And this has been a crazy week. Uh, we've had a lot going on this week. Uh, vice presidential debates, presidential debates, Twitter's going crazy, the president has COVID. Um, a lot has happened, a lot of news, but there is something in particular we do not want to just have slip away or kind of get buried by the uh, the news cycle. And that is a recent report about suicides, I believe from the Department of Defense. Uh, walk us through, what is this all about? So last week, the Department of Defense released their annual suicide report for calendar year 2019. Interestingly enough, that's not really where the big news was. So the 2019 report showed what you could probably guess, that we haven't made any headway on changing the trend in suicides among active duty troops or reserve troops or National Guard troops across any branch or demographic. Not a huge surprise, right? Have we made any headway on this in the military in the past years? No. Have we made any headway on this in the civilian population in this country? No. There hasn't really been a significant change in these trends over the past years. What the big news was is that, of course, everyone wants to know how is COVID-19 impacting suicide among troops. The Department of Defense releases quarterly reports. So we have quarterly reports from the first quarter and there was a spike. There was a pretty significant spike in suicides among active duty troops that coincided with the pandemic. And so that's what everyone wanted to know. Is COVID-19 leading to an increase in suicides among troops? And the Department of Defense was more or less completely mum and was refusing to definitively link those two. And so it's kind of turned into this conversation about, well, if you don't acknowledge that there's a problem now, are you doing anything to help with that problem now? The Department of Defense said that we won't really understand this spike in suicides until 2022. Essentially, we won't know until 2022 whether or not these COVID-19 restrictions are leading to more troop suicides. And for obvious reasons, that's not soon enough. Have we seen any other types of reports that have come out, maybe in the civilian sector or something that we could kind of match things up and correlate and go, maybe this is a, uh, directly related to the pandemic, or is this just like a statistical anomaly? So unfortunately, you can link a lot of the symptoms or of the side effects, you want to say, of the pandemic to an increase in suicides, isolation. That's one of the key factors in suicides and mental health issues. And the pandemic is creating a lot of isolation where there wasn't before. So you can take a lot of the side effects of the pandemic and link them to the factors that lead to suicides and lead to mental health issues. But you can't definitively say, hey, we're telling troops that they can't go further than 50 miles from Bragg and they're killing themselves. That's what the Department of Defense doesn't wanna say. And to be fair, no, they don't have that data. Every active duty troop who's committed suicide or has died by suicide hasn't said, hey, I'm gonna, I'm ending my life because you won't let me go further than 50 miles from Fort Bragg. Sure, they're not saying that. Does that mean that these travel restrictions aren't correlating to the increase in suicides among troops? When we talk about um, this report, who, who was measured in this report? Is it just active duty reservist? Does it include family members? So it's all of them. And it actually includes family members for the first time. Uh, the last two reports have included family members, and that was a pretty big deal when they first started doing it. The problem is that all encompassing report that was released last week is for calendar year 2019. And it's almost 2021. That's what they what that's what they mean when they say that we won't really understand these numbers until 2022 because we're getting quarterly reports. Right. We know that there's an increase in the raw number of suicides so far this year compared to previous years. And what the Department of Defense was very adamant in emphasizing is that you can't use raw numbers to make conclusions about data and trends and analysis, which is true. 
You can't use raw numbers to make in-depth analysis the way that you can with these big, massive annual reports that come out nearly two years after the calendar year. They're 100% correct. Does that mean that we can't be doing stuff about it now is the question because it's not just reporters, it's not just us. Senior Army leadership, the Secretary of the Army, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force have both said that COVID-19 is impacting stress levels. It's causing higher stress. Both of those senior leaders have said our suicide rates are increasing. COVID-19 is causing a lot of stress. But the DOD has been very careful not to link those two. And we think it's because the DOD wants to keep these travel restrictions in place. They want to keep the quarantines. They want to keep all of this in place. So of course, they don't want to insinuate or make any sort of implication that those measures are leading to an increase in suicides. Thinking that there is this, I, this thought, this thought process behind not making these correlations of COVID and the measures to suicides in order to maintain those restrictions, are they, is there a sense that they're looking out for the troops or a sense that they're trying to maintain some type of status quo? So I don't know how harsh we can be on the DOD when it comes to that, because they said that even though we won't have an analysis for two more years, we are taking action. But their actions, it's the same... <laughs> I don't want to use the word bullshit, but they're the same programs that the DOD has been implementing for years that have not moved the needle on troop suicide, haven't changed the trends. Things like they launched a video on social media about how to be distantly connected. They launched another program that teaches you the early warning signs of suicide. But how harsh can we be on the DOD? Because that's what everyone in the country is doing to try and prevent suicide. And no, it doesn't seem to be working, but... The DOD is just doing what everyone else is doing. So they did say that they have made a concerted effort to take action against what might be um, secondary effects of the pandemic on suicide rates. So where do we go from here? Where Where is the DOD going with this information? I understand the president, uh, he tweeted something out about this particular thing. I'm not really sure the details of that tweet. What did he tweet? Um, he, I could have sworn he tweeted something out about, um, you know, diverting resources to examining this particular report. Again, I, I may, there's so many presidential tweets that I might be getting this one confused with something else, but, uh, regardless of what the president tweeted, where is the DOD? What, what do we do with this information now? Where's the DOD going with this? Uh, what measures are going to be taking place? Is there going to be an investigation? What, what are we doing? Hopefully leadership takes note. Uh, military leadership, because a lot of it, a lot of research within the DOD has shown that military leadership at the command level, not up where Millie and Esper sit, has a lot to do with making sure that troops feel connected, troops feel that they have access to resources. So hopefully those military leaders are paying attention to this recent spike. The DOD is rolling back more and more travel restrictions for better or for worse. Some of those restrictions that are keeping troops away from their families, away from their loved ones are being rolled back. Um, that's really all that we can do from here, because according to the DOD, we won't have a statistical significant analysis for two more years. I guess the DOD just has to do what everyone else in the country is doing and keep plugging along. Well, I really hope that whatever follows this is thought through. And actually based in some level of, of science, I know that there's this, this tendency to kind of like just go off and, and knee-jerk reaction. Like, we got to do something. And people do things and invest a lot of time, money, and resources. And they're not really that founded in, in fact or science or any of that stuff. So hopefully going forward, there, there's going to be something done. Uh, where can people learn more about you, the work that you're doing here at Connecting Vets? You can follow me on Twitter at ECBHow. Libby, thanks for being on the show again. And of course, you can always go find us at ConnectingVets.com.
Uh, all right, folks. So right now we're living in a very politically sensitive time. Everybody is kind of wrapped around the axle about race and politics and whether you're left, right, white, black. It is, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a crazy mess right now. But something you don't expect to have to talk about is racism inside the service, racism as a veteran, and racism uh, from the VA. So to help us uh, talk about this subject a little more in depth, uh, I bring to you the wonderful, the amazing Abby Bennett. Thank you, Rod. Happy to be here. Awesome. Abby, tell me a little bit about what's going on with the VA. Uh, racism, that's that's not what we expect to talk about, but that's, that's something that's actually happening. Sure. I mean, it, nobody wants to be confronted with any kind of discrimination when we're talking about health care or benefits or anything like that. You know, those are places that you want to go and feel really safe. Um, those are places that you go to get better, um, not to feel worse. Um, but recently, uh, the biggest union that represents VA employees represents about 300,000 of the more than 400,000 VA employees. Um, they did a survey and got thousands of responses to that survey. And about 78% of the people who responded to that survey um, who work for VA said that they believe that racism is a problem within the Department of Veterans Affairs. And about 55% of them said that they, they had personally witnessed discrimination against a veteran patient. So this wasn't just about racism against employees or among each other. Working at VA, it was also about racism and discrimination against the veterans that they treat or that they deal with for benefits. So but that was obviously I'm, a really big issue. Um, I'm, I'm curious, though, when it comes to we're talking about racism against patients, did this report or did, is there a little more detail about what, what does that look like? I mean, does this mean we're denying care? Does this mean that uh, certain races or certain color of people are receiving different care than uh, somebody of color? Or somebody who's white, even I, I, I can't. I don't want to say like it. You know, when we say racism, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean against no. black or white. It, it could be any, uh, you know, uh, discrimination against a particular color. Um, what kind of racism are we seeing or being reported on? So that the details of that were not included in that specific survey report, or at least the information that they released in that survey. But we have seen reports from veterans over the years and recently about you know, what they perceive to be discrimination that they experienced. And it can be things that happen during an appointment. It can be, you know, at a benefits office when things don't go your way and you feel that that may have been influenced by, you know, the color of your skin or maybe even, you know, your gender or your gender identity, things like that. All of that counts as discrimination. Um, and there definitely have been veterans who have felt that way. When I've written stories about VA and racism, I've had veterans come into my inbox or my DMs and say, you know, hey, this happened to me. Um, and so there are lots and lots of different anecdotal stories like that where, you know, maybe they overheard a conversation among VA staff and they were in the waiting room and it was a conversation about race or it was a conversation about them um, and they felt really offended by that. It's a lot of different things and it, and it can manifest in a lot of different ways and that's why it's such a complicated issue. But among VA employees, we've heard more and more stories recently, um, especially centered around the Kansas City VA, um, where there have been issues. Some former staff members who have recently retired have come forward and talked about, you know, racial epithets being used against them. One uh, former nurse there, uh, whose name is uh, Charlene Brown, actually has come forward uh, quite a bit recently to tell stories about being called things like Aunt Jemima, um, about uh, a, a colleague calling her a tar baby. Um, and there was also an event held at the Kansas City VA for Juneteenth, where Black employees were asked to participate in what they called a living museum. Um, and they were asked to dress up as different figures, including um, Emmett Till, uh, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and also George Floyd. Um, <laughs> And so stop, stop. Hold on, man. Hold on. I want to make sure I'm, um we're talking about modern time. Yes. Somebody first of all, I want to approach the Aunt Jemima thing cuz I mean, I love her syrup. 
God bless her soul. But the fact that you would, anybody would use the Aunt Jemima, I don't know, words as a, as a slur. Um, okay. The, the tar baby thing. I, I I didn't know we were living in a Mark Twain novel. I mean, this is we this is old school racism. That's not even like new school racism. That's that's some old school stuff right there. Um, so we're talking about old school stuff today. This this generation, and then they ask black employees to dress up as a living museum, and one of them was was Floyd. Um, yeah. Wow. Tell me that was the worst. Tell me that was the worst that you heard. It's one of the worst for sure. And it's definitely one of the ones that has captured a lot of attention just because, you know, to those of us who are reasonable, uh, it seems really ridiculous. And frankly, if someone had told me that just in conversation, like if someone had called me and told me that I, I would have had a hard time believing it um, just because it's so out there, but it is true. It, is reflected in emails that went out to staff. Um, I believe the Washington Post was the first to report on those emails, but I also was forwarded those emails and have seen them myself. Um, so that is something that was asked of them. And it actually gets worse at that Juneteenth event. Um, and hopefully everybody knows the significance of Juneteenth and why it's even worse that this would be associated with that day. Um, they were going to serve refreshments as part of the event. And those refreshments included oh watermelon, fried oh. chicken, and Kool-Aid. <laughs> oh, my God. So. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's what gets me about stuff like this. Somebody approved it. So it's – it's this is a bureaucracy, okay? Nothing – you can't spend a dime – unless somebody signs off on this. And usually more than one person, like you wanna go buy refreshments for an event, there's at least three people who have to look at this list and go, okay, Abby, go buy this. Right. That means at least, at least one set of eyes. Mm -hmm. Saw this plan and nobody stopped to think, time out. Are we really doing this folks? Are we, fried chicken, Kool-Aid and what? Are we going to uh, – because if we do this, there's no going back. No matter what your intention is, this is going to look bad. Uh, wow. I don't even know what to say to that. Like, holy crap. It, it's a lot. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, there are lots of VA employees around the country. And I should, I should clarify, there are lots of former VA employees across the country who have come out with different stories of what they've experienced over the years, things that are recent and things that date back decades. Um, and then there are also a lot of current VA employees who have stories but who hesitate to come forward because they say they're afraid of retaliation and losing their jobs, which, you know, uh, unfortunately, there have been incidents of retaliation against employees at VA, um, like there have been at other federal agencies. It's not unique to VA, but it is certainly a problem that that agency has had. Um, so that's a big concern. You know, uh, what people really concerned about this issue are most worried about is how many more people have dealt with this or have witnessed these events, you know, either against staff members or against veterans, you know, and, and, can't tell their stories or are too afraid to tell their stories. And that's that's completely understandable. But the worry is, you know, how is that affecting VA operations at the end of the day? You know, how is that affecting care to veterans? Because what we do know is that having a negative experience, especially in a healthcare environment, discourages people from going to get health care. If you feel negatively about going to the clinic or going to the hospital, you're going to avoid going. Anybody could understand that. And the problem with that is, you know, veterans are at high risk for many, many different things. And getting their care is really important. And also, it's care that they earned. These are benefits that, you know, all veterans have earned and, and have a right to access. And for there to be something standing in the way of them getting the care that they you know, put in the time, blood, sweat, tears, and money for, you know, that's a problem. And that's a problem that everybody should be concerned about. So where 
do we go from here? And, and I hate to say it because, you know, that's that's usually my segue when I ask about a report or something that's come out of the DOD or the VA. Where do we go from here? But the problem is, um, well, God damn it. We should know where to go from here. Uh, this shouldn't even be happening. It's 2020. We've had riots. We've had uh, people on the street. We've had people dying over racist shit, which is crazy to me that it's 2020. People are dying over racism. Uh, and and still, we don't have the common sense to look at something like uh, a fried chicken Kool-Aid and watermelon dinner on Juneteenth. Like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe like there is I'm not sure if we're not striking the right sensitivity. Uh, and I know I know a lot of you guys out there, a lot of veterans, a lot of pe- folks uh, have this opinion, this perspective that we're living in an overly soft, sensitive world. I get it. Um, I'm not saying that we need to put the kid gloves on for everybody. And I'm not saying that uh, we need to hold sensitivity training for every single human being, but maybe some common sense training. I, I don't know where the line between common sense and sensitivity where do those cross? But it seems like there's a problem here. Is the VA talking about that? Are they, what's, what's the scoop on that? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because, um, so earlier this week on Tuesday night, I believe it was, um, a bunch of civil rights leaders, including from the NAACP and different faith groups, held a press conference about some of these issues at the VA. Um, And the day before that happened, um, I got an email that showed that VA was canceling an anti-racism event that they were planning to hold. Um, And it was going to be about racism at the department and resources for people who experience (laughs) things like that. And they canceled it and they said that they weren't going to reschedule it. And when I checked in on it, one thing that the VA told me was that they were adhering to President Trump's recent executive order, which essentially and effectively bans a lot of sort of racial sensitivity training in federal agencies. Um, From the president's perspective, holding racial sensitivity training is in in and of itself discriminatory. Um, You know, I think there are a lot of people who feel like racial sensitivity training um, really sort of puts the burden on white people. Um, And it can be a very uncomfortable experience. It can be an experience where you feel like you're the target of a lot of things. Um, And those are very difficult conversations to have. Uh, But the people who really believe that they're necessary um, and want them to continue to happen believe that they should be hard conversations um, and that they do bring up a lot of really sensitive topics, but that they're topics that we need to air and deal with and work through. Um, and you can't do that if you're canceling these sessions. Um, so where we go from here, uh, well, it looks like VA itself is not go- going to be holding any meetings or trainings about things on this subject so long as that executive order holds. Um, But as far as the investigation that the Government Accountability Office is going to do, they're going to take the time to do it. Um, I think they said they um, it will be done in about six months. Um, It could be even longer than that. That's kind of the issue with investigations like that. They have to look at, you know, an entire giant government agency and they have to pull all the evidence and they have to check up on all of those stories and accounts and things like that. So it does take time, but when uh, when we see the results of that, I'm sure it will be really enlightening on the situation there. I remember as a kid um, in Arizona, you would think in Arizona there'd be a lot of like other Mexican kids in, in your class, but I ended up in a class where I was uh, with, like the only brown kid in the whole class, and it was Cinco de Mayo, and I remember I sat down and I, you know. I, I'm Latino, but we don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo, if I'm perfectly honest with you. That's like, if you're from Mexico, that's your mm-hmm. holiday. But, uh, you know, we're third generation Americans. So uh, not a really big thing in our in our house. And the, the teacher brings up Cinco de Mayo. And I remember this moment because it was odd. It was almost creepy because she's like, it's a Mexican holiday. And all these little faces turn towards me. They're like... <laughs> tell us about it, Rod. Tell us more. And I'm like, I have no idea what the hell this shit's about. <laughs> like, I'm a little kid. I'm like, I have, I have no idea. Uh, Mexican Independence Day, maybe? I don't know. 
Is it like Mexican Christmas? I, I don't know. I have no idea. All I know is that uh, a lot of people like to go out and have a good time and there's some fireworks in Tucson. Um, this is a bummer, man. It's such a bummer to hear because it, this is the thing that, this is the one wedge that keeps getting driven inside the veteran community, inside the service member community, inside you know society in general. Um, God damn it, you know, like just, uh, Folks, reel your, reel, reel your people in, whether they're white, black, Hispanic, doesn't matter. Reel your people in. You need to listen. And when your colleagues say some dumb stuff like, hey, you know what we should do? It's Cinco de Mayo. Maybe we should have all the Latinos. We should give them all zarapes and sombreros. Like, time out, dude. I don't care what race you're coming up with this idea. This is going to blow up in our face. Let's just, let's just put up the banner. Like, it's Cinco de Mayo. Cool and leave it at that. Stop trying to get crazy, Try, quit trying to pull one up and 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 gas it up. Uh, sometimes when in the workplace, you just point at the poster. <laughs> That's it, it's well, Cinco think, de Mayo, you know, that's it. The, the word sensitivity comes with this really weird connotation and a really negative connotation. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what they're what they're really asking for is for you to listen, you know, and for you to be aware and accountable of what you're saying and what you're doing, you know, and understand that what you say and do affects other people. And you may not understand why that person feels that way. And you may not agree with them feeling that way. But at the end of the day, you know, we should all care about each other and we should care when somebody else is hurting or when someone else is having a hard time, especially if we caused it, whether we agree or not. You know, and that that's what it is at the end of the day. You know, one thing that I've really appreciated, you know, about my background, you know, my dad was active duty my whole life um, until pretty much when I graduated college. We moved around constantly. I went to Dodia schools pretty much my whole life until high school. Um, and I was really lucky because uh, within those army schools, I grew up with so many different people. I grew up with people from so many different backgrounds. Um, you know, my classrooms were so diverse and I got to learn from so many people um, and get an understanding of so many different cultures. And that's really shaped me as a person. You know, I, I have a great interest in other people. I have a great sensitivity to other people and their viewpoints and, you know, how they approach the world. And I understand how that's very different from how other people grew up. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of value in that. And that diversity I experienced in the classroom as a dependent is the diversity that was reflected in the military itself in a way. Um, so it's, that's such a tight knit community where you guys love each other so much and you support each other so much through so many things, you know, to see the community divided over things like that, things that should make you stronger, um, that, sh that do make you stronger, that do make our military much stronger. You know, our military is incredibly diverse. We have people from all over the world join our military and want to serve the United States of America and are proud to do so. And that makes us stronger. All those different skill sets, all those different viewpoints, um, all those different strengths really, really make us better and make us safer. And then it makes the veteran community so rich. There's so many talented people in that community. Um, who come from all different backgrounds. And it's not just race, it's also things like socioeconomics. You know, I was a first generation college student. Um, there are people in, that, in the veteran community who come from so many different backgrounds and that's what makes it such a great community Absolutely. You know, to be a part of and to cover. Yeah. That, that's the beauty of, our, our, of the service. As a veteran, uh, I worked with white, black, Hispanics, uh, Asian dudes, Russian dudes, German dudes, I, I, I've worked with everybody. But more importantly, the thing that unifies us is that we were all duped into joining. That's right, we all fell for the trap, whether it was a $10,000 signing bonus or a GI Bill, we all fell for it, unless you office, that's the regular officers, they, okay, don't worry about it, ROTC. That's a whole different story. Whole different story, folks. And some of y'all just wanted to pay back your loan. <laughs> You're like, oh no, I just want to, I just want my college degree. Folks, uh, you can reach Abby Bennett at connectingvets.com. Abby, where else can we find you? I spend way too much time on Twitter. Um, so if I'm not uh, 
here with you or writing stories, I'm probably on Twitter 24 hours a day. Um, and I'm there at Abby, A-B-B-I-E, the letter R, and Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T. There you go, folks. Make sure you uh, follow her on Twitter and, uh, you know, be cordial, be nice people. You know what's crazy is we got to talk, we got to have a chat, you and I, on the show about the craziness that happens as a female reporter in this world. I didn't know this. I didn't know half of what was going on in your world. Uh, as a dude, I don't have to deal with some of this stuff. Thankfully, I think. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, folks, if you ask nicely, I'll tell you my story about how I befriend, how I actually discovered one of my close friends was a neo-Nazi and we're still friends today. Ooh. I know, right? Like that's a tale for another time. Leave your comments below. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna be down here or up here. I don't know what's happening anymore. Who knows? Zuckerberg and the Twitter and the Dorseys and the YouTubies. Uh, leave some comments, leave some likes, make sure you're subscribing. Folks, I'm Rod Rodriguez, that was Abby Bennett. We had Elizabeth Howe earlier. That's the show, that's it, say goodbye, Abby. Bye.